uh, wonderful to be with you here this morning. Uh, it's a really pretty day outside. Uh, and that even makes it better, being that we've had like six days of rain. And then all of a sudden we have this uh, day of sunshine. And you see people get so irritable. You know, if you haven't seen the sun in six days, you kind of get upset. Uh, but then you have one day of sunshine, and that seems to lift everyone back up. And, and that's what, you know, assembling on the first day of the week is it's for us spiritually. You, you spend six days out in the world, and then on Sunday you're able to assemble with the saints, and you're uplifted. You, you're brought back, and, and you get to share in communion with each other and with Christ once again. And I believe that's one of the purposes, of, one of the reasons why we meet. Uh, it's the same way that we see sunshine uh, on days that have just been nothing but storms. This is going to be part two of what we started Sunday night. Uh, Sunday night we were talking about church signs and lampstands. And what we usually focused on mainly on Sunday night was the church sign part. What does the church sign mean? Uh, is it important that we have a church sign? Is it important what's on that church sign? And we explained that, yes, it is important what's on the church sign. It identifies to the community who we are and what we stand for. And that's why it's out there. However, the problem is, is when we start automatically connecting church signs to lampstands. And lampstands is what we see in Revelation. This is what Jesus sees the local church as. Now, can a church have a church sign and also have a lampstand? Well, of course, yes. But if the church automatically has a church sign, does that make it also have a lampstand? Well, no. And we're going to look at that and we're going to explain the difference between church signs and lampstands. Mainly, this sermon for this time is going to be focused on the lampstands. And we'll see that in the book of Revelation. To kind of quickly review and go what we talked about, just so if anyone wasn't here Sunday night and it's like, Andrew, where in the world are you at? Uh, I, I wasn't here. This is what we talked about. We talked about it, the saved Christian, the one that's been baptized into Christ through faith, is part of the Lord's church. And this is the, what we call the universal church. We explained that the word universal isn't in the New Testament, but we do read about the general assembly. We do read about the church as a whole. This is all of the saved individuals that ever lived on this earth. Jesus adds the saved to this church. This is the church that Jesus gave himself for, and this is the church that he built. So this is the universal Lord's church. And then we talked about the local church. If you're a member at the Church of Christ here at Gardendale, you're part of a local body. You're a congregation of disciples in this area that meet, that meet to worship. Uh, and this is what we see, and we also see examples of this in the New Testament. And let's all turn in our Bibles to Revelation. And we'll read this passage again that we just read last time. And we'll be staying in this book for, for a large part of this morning. This is John. He's on the island of Patmos. And he's on this island and the Holy Spirit gives him this, this revelation. And this is really going to be the last revelation that we have here recorded. And when he gives him this revelation, the main purpose of this revelation is that Jesus has seven things that he wants to tell to seven different local congregations. And John is going to be the avenue for Jesus to say these things to these churches. Verse 10 of chapter 1 of Revelation. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in the book and send it to these seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. So we've been introduced into the lampstand. Well, what is the lampstand? Well, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. If we look in verse 20... Jesus tells John that the lampstands that he sees are these local churches, that each of these lamp, lampstands represents either the church at Ephesus or Pergamos or Thyatira. Verse 20, The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. And what we see here, and what this revelation gives us, is that this is the way Jesus views these local congregations. He sees them as individual units that belong to Him. 
Now let me say, I don't know if there's actually physically lampstands in heaven that Jesus looks at. I, I, I don't know. But I know that maybe even metaphorically, through the revelations, this is the attitude that Jesus views these local congregations as. This is the analogy. They're lampstands. So we're going to look at this from the lampstand point of view. We see in verse 13 that Jesus, the Alpha and Omega, is in their midst. He walks amongst these lampstands. Verse 13, And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. And it goes on to explain what Jesus looks like through John's revelation. Uh, And and basically what you see in his physical attributes is that he's all-powerful. It's almost to the point that it's this terrible fear comes upon John because just the way of Jesus looks, because he sees him as he truly is. It's this awe-inspiring creature. And he's walking amongst these lampstands. Meaning to say that all of these lampstands, these different local congregations, these all belong to him. That's why he's among them. He's in charge. He's among all of these different local congregations. And then he goes on to write this individual letter to each of these different churches. And he starts the letter the same exact way to Ephesus, to Pergamos, to Philadelphia. He starts them all in the same way. He says, I know your works. And every single one. If we just look at the church of Ephesus, because that's the first one we see. Chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those which are of the apostles which are not, and have found them liars. And then he goes on to even some say to some things that he knows about them that isn't good. He knows absolutely everything about his local congregations. And on one hand, we can be extremely happy with that. And overall, we're going to be happy with that. Jesus knows all the good things about Gardendale, doesn't he? He knows all the good things. He knows who's making an effort to study. He knows who's making an effort to worship with spirit and truth. He knows which of us truly worship this morning. He knows who's taking the time to study with who. He knows who's making more of an effort to get to know their brethren more. He knows... All about that. He knows who's working hard in our Bible classes to make sure like our young ones are learning. He knows. But also we see in these seven letters, he also knows all the bad stuff that's going on. All the things that these churches needed to work on. He knows who's left their first love. He knows who's upset with who. He knows who's holding all their anger in and burning in hate instead of talking to somebody. He knows about what's going on in your life. He knows. And I would go on to say he even knows about things that are are almost we consider trivial considered to the spiritual things. Not that they are trivial, they are important, but he knows what's on the church sign. He knows about the work day we had yesterday. He knows about the construction we're going to do down here to try to redo a lot of these Bible classrooms. He knows all about that. Why? Because this is his church. And he knows every single thing about that. So as we go through this, we're going to have this in mind. He knows everything about Garndale. There's nothing hidden from his sight. What I want to do now is I want to look at three different examples and show you that with Jesus' relationship with these lampstands. What's his control over them? What can the lampstands do for him? Lampstands, they cannot, they can, they can be removed by Christ. And this is what he threatens to do to the church of Ephesus unless they repent. If we look in chapter 2 again, here starting in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. So the church of Ephesus had left their first love. They'd done this purposely. They had forgotten on purpose what their purpose was as a church. They had left Christ. Now, even though they were doing all these things, there's this one thing he had against them. So what's the threat? What is Jesus going to do unless they repent of this? Well, he's going to remove their lampstand. 
And by removing their lampstand, Jesus isn't going to consider the church of Ephesus a local congregation anymore belonging to him. Sure, y'all are assembling together on the first day of the week. Maybe, sure, you're doing all these things. Sure, you have a church sign out, but I don't consider you to be a church anymore. Because you don't have a lampstand. I've removed it because you did not repent. And we do see that Jesus gives them plenty of time to repent, doesn't he? He says, I'm going to give you time. He hasn't removed the lampstand yet. But he expects them to repent. So could Jesus remove the lampstand here at Gardendale? Yes, he could remove the lampstand here at Gardendale if we fail to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If we fail to heed his instruction and his word. Now this is a sense of logic, what I'm going to say next. Our fathers tell us, I, you know, if I brought you into this world, I can take you out. And that's, that's flawless logic. Well, this is what we could assume that what we've read here in Revelation 2, 4, 5, that if they can be removed, then they also can be added. Jesus, I believe, has the authority to add a lampstand. You have a local group that comes together of saved individuals on the first day of the week to worship two or three in there. Well, Jesus is going to give them a lampstand. If they're following him, if this is truly going to be a group of disciples about him. Now, you could say as well, I would imagine, let's say the church of Ephesus does not repent, falls away. Jesus removes their lampstand, but maybe some years down the road they decide, hey, we need to get straight. We need to get back together. We need to go back to the word of God, and we need to get this church going again. Could Jesus give them back their lampstand? Reading about the authority Jesus has here, I would say yes. He could give back the lampstand. He can do whatever he pleases with the lampstands. They're all his. So he can remove them and he can add them. If we see later on as well, he can remove an individual from himself without removing the entire lampstand. An individual person in a local congregation without removing the entire group. Revelation 2.20 now. Here are the church at Thyatira. And this is the one Jesus calls Jezebel, a member here at this local congregation. Verse 20, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill our children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. So the church of Ephesus was an overall problem. They have left their first love. Thyatira, the main problem was they had one individual that was sinning. That was causing a problem to the point that Jesus calls her Jezebel. And she's living in sexual morality and she's inducing the other groups to do it. Now he gets on to them that you're still taking part with her. You allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a seductress. You allow her to be with you. He has that against the group. Now what he's going to do is he's going to give Jezebel plenty of time to repent. He's already given her time to repent. She doesn't know that she's going to cast her into a sick bed. So she's going to be sick. And Jesus is going to give her time to repent. You see how long-suffering he is with, with this woman. But eventually, if she doesn't repent, he's going to remove her from himself. He's going to blot her name out of the book of life. Now, what we can compare this to is 1 Corinthians. We don't have a sexual immoral woman, but we have a sexual immoral man in 1 Corinthians, don't we? Now, Jesus came back immediately. Would he... Take care of that man? Yes, he would. But would the whole congregation be punished for this man? That's maybe a little more difficult question. Because Paul tells them that you need to remove him. If he's not going to repent, you have to withdraw from him. Because he's going to affect the whole group as a whole. So we see here that God can individually remove individuals, but we still have a responsibility to not take part with these people. If they refuse to. To repent. And that's a sermon for another day. And there's a process that needs to be done for that, a biblical process. But you can see the effect here. And we see something similar in Revelation 3, 4, 5. Uh, that he knows who's still faithful to him in a congregation, even in a weak local group. That he's going to repay everyone by their works. Chapter 3. Here, the church at Sardis. This was called, we call it the dead church. 
Uh, he says there in verse 1, And the angel of the church of Sardis write these things. He says, Who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars? I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. And I read that verse, and I thought it was so fitting for what we were talking about uh, last Sunday night and this morning. Can you have a name that you're alive and be, still be a church that's dead? The church of Sardis did. The name Church of Christ means and tells everyone we're alive, but we could still be a church that was dead, couldn't we? Yes, we could. If we keep on reading into verse 3, Remember therefore how you have received and heard, hold fast and to repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. And you will not know an hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white. They are worthy. Here is the other example of that. You see a weak congregation this week overall, yet you still have individuals trying to do what's right. You have individuals that are still trying to stir up love, stir up good works. Individuals that are still following Christ the best way they know how. Now, are they going to be condemned because the whole congregation is weak? Not yet removing its lampstand, but just weak? He says, I'm not. I know. I know the individuals. And I use these two points to say this. This is what I mean by these last two points I make. On Judgment Day, you cannot hide behind your local congregation. That's what he's saying both of you. He's going to judge us by our works as individuals. Now, one thing that's going to be brought up is that what church you were a part of and what you did in that church, yet you will still be judged individually. You can't hide behind your local congregation. If you're going to a strong church and you're still doing evil, he still can remove you if you don't repent, even though you're still a member of this local congregation, according to our perspective, from our viewpoint. He still knows what you're doing. Now, if you're at a weak congregation and you're still doing right, you're still doing the best you can, you're trying to get the congregation moving again, he appreciates that. And he knows about that. And he will judge you again, you also, according to your works. So these are the things that we pick up in the Revelation. He can remove a lampstand. He can add a lampstand. Now, ultimately, Jesus is the only one who can remove or add a lampstand. He is the only one that has the authority to do so. So if I came and visited Gardell and I didn't like what I saw, and I went and told people, well, Gardell doesn't have a lampstand, does that make it true? No, because I don't have the authority to do that. Only Jesus Christ has the authority to add or remove lampstands. And this is the big question I wanted to get to in the past two sermons we did. Does Gardell have a lampstand? Because it's something we need to constantly examine ourselves on, don't we? If the church at Ephesus is one that was patient and has done all these great things all through the New Testament, Jesus is removing, is threatening to remove their lampstand, I would want to be worried. I want to be concerned. And I want to do the best I can to make sure that Jesus would never say that to Gardendale. Never feel that way towards this group of individuals. It's ultimately Christ's decision, but I still need to make a judgment call. I need to know where to worship. I need to know what group to be a part of. Back to the church at Corinth. You have a man that's sexually immoral, and you have the entire group is allowing this man to continue living this way. And I would be visiting, and I'd be looking for a place uh, to worship, and I come upon the church at Corinth, and I see them allowing this man to live this way, and I know about it. Wouldn't I be concerned? Do you think I would automatically, oh yeah, let me jump in this group, let me be a part of this group. I may choose not to do so in that current situation because they could drag me down. They're going to have an influence on me. I want to keep myself pure, so I may choose not to be a part of this congregation for my own sake. Now, I also could see a congregation that was doing a lot of the right things. I could go visit the church at Philippi, see a lot of good things going on. They're not perfect. They have some things they have to work on, but they are doing, and they seem, as from my perspective, to have a lampstand. Well, this congregation is going to help me. This congregation is somebody I want to be a part of. They're going to encourage me. They're going to uplift me. They're going to help me be ready for the day of judgment. I want to be a part of this local group. So we do have to make a judgment. We do have to discern what congregation we want to be a part of. Well, how are we going to do that? 
Well, there is not a passage that teaches us about how to pick a church, necessarily. But there are many, many passages that God gives us about judgments, about discernments, about making important spiritual decisions in our lives. So what I want to look at is I want to look at 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, Paul instructs Timothy not how to decide what church to go to, but how to decide what elder, what man should serve as an elder. If someone has an accusation of an elder, how would you handle that? How could you say, well, this man truly isn't an elder anymore because of the things he's done in his life? Now, we can take this and apply it to the way we would view the church. What do we need to do to see if this church has a lampstand or not? So let's look at that. 1 Timothy 5. Let's actually uh, not pick up at the very bottom, but let's pick up in verse 19. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest may also fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. So right here at the end of this verse that we just read, verse 21, he says you don't need to handle this situation with prejudice, but you know what, Timothy, you don't need to do anything with partiality, doing nothing with partiality. This is for all judgments. Now back to our situation, can you show partiality when you judge if a church has a lampstand or not? Yes, you can show a prejudice making this judgment call. Too many times when it is time to make an important decision about where I'm going to be at, where I'm going to worship with, who am I going to be a part of, I let Andrew Smith get in the way of the decision that needs to be made. Does this congregation have a lampstand? We can get very sentimental towards local groups, and we start judging them unfairly. We can give a church way too much credit, can't we? My grandmama goes to this congregation. Maybe this congregation is doing all these terrible things. Maybe this congregation isn't following Jesus at all. But you know what? My grandmama goes there. Can I be unfair with my judgment to that congregation? Yes, I can because my grandmama goes there. And that's a little one. You can get even bigger. Do we sometimes show partiality to what's on the church sign? Yes, we can show partiality to what's on the church sign. Would you go to a congregation? Because you can go out in the backwoods, can't you? Would you go to a congregation that didn't even have a church sign? You can show partiality there. What if you go out in the backwoods? You go to a congregation that, let's just say, we know has a lampstand. We could observe they have a lampstand. Yet they just have a sign that says, the church meets here. You can show partiality in that situation. Now, you can also show partiality with any church that has the phrase Church of Christ on the sign, can't you? Will you go into and worship with any church that has Church of Christ on the sign just because it has Church of Christ on the sign? I hope not. Because there again, you can show prejudice and partiality all about the church sign and not about what Paul tells Timothy here, what you observe. What you observe. What do you judge by? You judge by their fruits. Now, having said all that, let me explain something about the church sign. It is a fruit, isn't it? A congregation can choose a bad name for a church sign. And that can make a judgment from a bad name. I'm not going to try out the church of Star Wars. I'm not. Because I can tell what these people are about by the church sign. All right, and you have all these really satanic cults and stuff, and you can go to places that you see, like the Church of Satan. I'm not going to try that church, because that's a work that they've done. That's something that they've built, and this is what they're identifying to the community as. I don't want to be a part of that. But also, I want to observe and judge congregations by their works, not what's by on the church sign, as long as that church sign is something biblical. Something I can see. You know what? This is a good name for a church. And there are more good names than just Church of Christ.
There are. Church of Christ is a great name. It's a biblical name. We talked about it. It's in Romans. We can read it. But in 1 Corinthians 11, we also see Church of God. He uses that phrase. In Revelation here, we've been reading about the Church of the City. Church of Ephesus, Church of Pergamos. All of those are good names. But I don't want to judge by a church sign. I want to judge by the entirety of all of the works that this congregation does to the best of my ability. Let's keep on reading here. Verse 22. Do not lay hands on anyone's hastily, nor share in any other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Now here it is. This is why we're doing this, right? We want to keep ourselves pure. Because if you take part in a congregation that's doing evil, you're going to end up sharing in their sins. So this is why it's so important that we're making this judgment call. Verse 23. No longer drink only water, but use little wine for your stomach's sake, for your frequent infirmities. Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment. But those of some men will follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. You can only judge in this situation by what is evident, what you can observe. I can come in here, and I can be a part of this congregation for ten years, but am I always going to know everyone's hearts and minds? I can't. That's impossible for a human to do. Now, I know Jesus knows, but I can only judge what's observable. I can't judge your heart perfectly. I I wish I could, but we just don't have that ability. Now, he says here that's something I don't have to worry about because God's going to handle that. He can see in man's hearts. He has the authority to do that. I can only observe what is evident. I can only judge those things that are observable. So what I want to give you now is some observable things that you can judge about a church. And I've just got three. And these aren't all the things, but these are just some things that get us in the right direction. The same this question, do we have a lampstand? Well, does this congregation hear and obey what the Spirit says to the churches? And that's how he ends in every letter in Revelation, doesn't he? He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Or, does this congregation refuse him who speaks? And this all goes back to what we talked about Sunday night, about authority. Where are you getting your authority from? Why do you worship the way you do? Is it because Jesus told you to do it that way? Or is it because you just made it up? Why do we take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week? Is that because the Holy Spirit told us to do that? Or is that because that's the day we just want to do it? Where is they getting their authority from? Well, hopefully this congregation looks towards Jesus for the authority. Looks towards the Word of God, what the Holy Spirit has given us. The things that they've spoken to us, we have ears we can hear. So we're going to hear and we're going to receive instruction for the one who's in our midst. The one has the authority to do all of this. And this right here, if the church focuses on this, then they automatically do have a lampstand, don't they? If they can truly do this. Because this is what this is all about. This is all about following the leader. This is all all about submitting to our Savior, the one who was crucified for us. Here's another one that goes into this, and all of these go into this. But do we assemble on the first day of the week to have communion with Christ? And I've been reading in this, and we've been going through Acts uh, with a private study I've been a part of. And what do all the early church members do? What do you keep on reading about? They keep on assembling together to break bread. What they keep on doing is they assemble together to take the supper. Now, why do we do it on the first day of the week? Because that's the only day the Spirit told us to do it. We see that in Acts 27. You may already know that verse. You may need to turn there. But it just says, it's a little bitty phrase, on the first day of the week when the disciples had gathered together to break bread or to take the supper. It depends on what version you're reading out of. That's all we have. But is that good enough? It should be. Because that's what the Spirit has told to the churches. The church of Ephesus received from the Spirit in Revelation that, those few verses. Just a few. The church of Ephesus say, well, I'm, I'm sorry Jesus, but that's not enough information. No. They didn't want to do that. Or they would have heed what Jesus said to him because it was coming from the Spirit. So that's why we do this. And all through the New Testament, the Lord's Supper is always this key event. It's on the first day of the week. It's on the day that Jesus came back 
from the grave, completing the covenant. Not only dying from our sins, but giving us the promise of the resurrection. It's also through creation, the day he created the light. The first day of the week has always been significant. And what did that light do? It divided the light and the darkness. What divides us from the world? Well, we have communion with Christ. That's what divides us from the world. Why are we assembled together today? To break bread. To take the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians 10, when Paul's trying to tell them, you can't go have fellowship with demons, you can't go and sacrifice them in the temple, and do what? Come and take communion with Christ. Take the Lord's Supper. The blood represents the covenant. It represents what all of our relationship with Jesus is all about. So if I went and visited Gardendale, and if here we don't do this, but if we either did not take the Lord's Supper, or we treated it carelessly, or we did it on the wrong day, could I say that Gardendale had a lampstand? It would be very, very difficult for me to say that. It's very, very difficult for anyone to debate that a church would have a lampstand if they treat the Lord's Supper the wrong way. And what I mean by having a lampstand is completely refusing it. Now, there's, under, there's an idea of we could be weak in something and we could be working on something, but to just to treat it carelessly. This is what makes us a local congregation. This is why we assemble together. It's this key event. So if you treat that wrong, I don't believe I can worship with you because of what the Spirit says to the churches. I believe if I didn't do this the right way, if I wasn't with a group that would do this the way that God instructed us to do, I would be refusing Him who speaks. And I know I and each one of you, what I know of you, would hate that. It would never want to refuse him who instructs us and tells us what to do. Also, is this congregation holy? Holy over all. What does a lampstand do physically? A lampstand shines. The lamp shines, but it's actually on a stand. That's why we call it a lampstand. The stand is holding the light up for all to see. That's what a lampstand does. It provides light. Is this congregation providing light? Do people look at this congregation and say, they're different. They're holy. Now, we can never be holy as God is holy perfectly. That's something we haven't reached yet. But are we doing our best to imitate the holiness of God? If you came into a congregation and people were sexually immoral. If you came into a congregation and people couldn't control their mouth. And you look at this as an overall, not as individuals, and I say this congregation is, is, is not holy. Would this congregation have a lampstand? Probably not. And to keep myself pure, I don't want these group of people to drag me down. I would try to remove myself and look for another place to worship with. Because this congregation is not shining its light. It's not seeing a lampstand that's shining. If you're not a lampstand that's shining, what are you doing? You're just an object. Uh, you're just something sitting there that's doing absolutely nothing. And you can picture Jesus. Uh, and this is something we all need to do to make sure that we do stay holy, that we continue to shine, it, it is to look and think Jesus is walking in the midst of these lampstands. And what if there's a lampstand there that's not even burning? It's not even working anymore. I would imagine that unless that lampstand repents, Jesus would quickly remove it because it's not serving its purpose anymore. It's not holy. And those are just three things that you can make a judgment call with. Things that, as Paul says, are very observable. These are things that are easy to spot. And you can make a judgment. Does this place have a lampstand? Even though ultimately, it's only Jesus' decision. I appreciate so much uh, your patience with this. There's a lot of stuff that I wanted to talk about. I know this was a two-parter, so what I want to do before we close is I just want to ask two questions. Two questions. Think about these questions. I'm going to give you the answer. But to look at these two parts as a whole, the church sign and the lamp sign, and we've already kind of covered this, so they're not too difficult. If a congregation has a church sign, do they automatically have a lamp stand? No. They do not automatically have a lamp stand. A church sign is something nice. It's good to identify what we are about. But it is not automatically they have a lampstand. I'm not going to do this, but if I stole that church sign and I put it out in front of my house, does that automatically mean that I am a church by myself? 
Absolutely not. That means I stole a sign. They have nothing to do with each other. Even though it's our way of saying that we believe we do. But that does not automatically give it a lampstand. It's about the observable evidence of the works of the congregation. If a congregation has Church of Christ on their sign, do they automatically have a lampstand? No. They do not automatically have a lampstand. As I said, Cowles of Times, Church of Christ is a good name. It's a perfect name to identify to the community exactly who we are, what we are all about. We are all about Christ. But just because we have Church of Christ written on something does not mean that it belongs to Jesus. It does not mean it belongs to Jesus. But what that's all about is doing what we're supposed to do. Hearing what the Spirit says to the churches. Doing what Jesus, our leader, has instructed us to do in following Him. This is what it's all about. Following Him. And as soon as we take Him out of the picture, that's when He takes us out of the picture. And that's the last thing we do. We want. As I said last time, I do love this congregation. And what I observe, I've only been, I guess, here a year and a couple months and a summer. I don't know how that time works like that. But what I have observed is that we do have a lampstand. I've seen it. I've compared it to the gospel, and I can see we do have a lampstand. Now, that's not to say that we need to have stuff we need to work on. Of course we need to work on. But we want to strive, do the best we can to make sure our leader is happy with us. And that Jesus can be in the midst of these lampstands, and he can look at the one that represents Gardendale and say, that one's mine. That one right there, that one's mine. And that's our hope. And that's our gain. At the very end of when Jesus finishes talking to these different groups, uh, these different lampstands, he ends it with just something absolutely beautiful. He says, I stand at the door knocking, and anyone, anyone who's willing to hear me And open the door, I will come in and I will dine with them and him with me. Saying that I'm here, I'm waiting, I'm knocking, I'm asking for you. And if you're willing to hear me and allow me in, I will be with you. I will be with you. If there's anyone here that's refusing him who speaks, who hears that knock and is refusing to hear him, but now realizes that you want to let the door in. You want to open the door, you want to let Christ in and you want to be with him. If there's any way we can assist you with that this morning, we ask you to come forward as we stand and sing.